Good evening, everyone. My name is Nicole Milano, and I serve as the head of the Medical Central Archives at New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Medicine. Welcome to this evening's lecture with Dr. Susan Clark Ball, coordinated by the Heberden Society at Weill Cornell Medicine. I want to begin by thanking the New York Academy of Medicine, which serves as our co-sponsor for tonight's lecture. Now, I do have a few announcements to make before we begin. The first is that I would invite you to join us for the final Heberden Society lecture this academic year. On April 27th at 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Dr. Keith Weilu will pull back the curtain to reveal the hidden persuaders who shaped menthol cigarette buying habits in racial markets across America. I will be sending out more information regarding registration following tonight's lecture. Now, if you're a member of the Weill Cornell Medicine community, you may be interested in participating for the book club for Pushing Cool by Dr. Keith Weilu. This will be held on April 28th at 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The book club will explore the historical and enduring perceptions of health and race with a discussion co-facilitated by Dr. Erica Phillips and Dr. David Scales. Now, for those who are interested in the history of the New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Medical Center, I would invite you to explore the website for our very own Medical Center archives. The archives includes photographs and documents dating all the way back to 1771, including this image of a hospital pharmacist from 1983. Now, thousands of photographs and documents are digitized and available for reference through the link seen here. I now want to invite Arlene Shainer, the Historical Collections Librarian from the New York Academy of Medicine, to share a few words about her institution. So, the New York Academy of Medicine Library is delighted to be a co-sponsor of the Heberden Lecture. Um, we are 175 years old this year, founded in the, at the very beginning of 1847. And at the New York Academy of Medicine now, we tackle barriers that prevent everyone from living a healthy life gener by generating knowledge, changing systems, and engaging the public to ensure health for all. We are committed to health equity. The library at the Academy, which will be on my next slide, <laughs> So I'm just, there we go, has been open to the public since 1878, although we've had a library since the very beginning of the Academy, and it is now one of the most significant history of medicine and public health collections in the country, if not the world. We have digital collections, events, we publish a monthly newsletter, and I do virtual visits to different um, uh, small parts of the collection on a regular basis. You can find out more by going to the link at the bottom of the screen. Um, and you can always send email to me at library at niam.org with questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Arlene. Now we invite participation in our question and answer session following tonight's lecture. You'll find a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen where you can enter a question and we'll get to as many as possible following today's lecture. So on that note, I'll turn the virtual microphone over to Pauline Flam Dunoyer, current Lyle Cornell Medical Student Representative to the Heberden Society, Dermatology Research Fellow at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and the 2021 Roberts Lifestyle and Diversity Scholars Award winner, who will be introducing our speaker this evening. Thank you so much, Nicole. Hi, everyone. I have the honor of introducing Dr. Susan Ball, Today, she's a professor of clinical medicine and the assistant director of the Birnbaum Unit, Center for Special Studies at New York Presbyterian Hospital. She has worked as a clinician caring for patients with HIV and AIDS for nearly 30 years. She received her medical degree from the Medical College of Pennsylvania and trained in internal medicine at the Upstate Medical Center in Syracuse, New York. She received a master's of public health and a master's of science in narrative medicine from Columbia University. Dr. Ball is the primary investigator for an NIH sponsored K07 grant titled, For the Sake of the Students, Enhancing the Teaching of Behavioral and Social Sciences in the Medical School. She has been an active and dedicated teacher at Wall Cornell Medical College, developing and directing courses chiefly focused on hum humanism in medicine. She is the author of the topic of today's webinar, Voices in the Band, about her career treating patients with HIV and AIDS and since the early days of the epidemic. Welcome, Dr. Ball, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> 
and thank you, Pauline, for that kind introduction. I have uh, no conflicts of interest to disclose. It's really an honor for me to be presenting a lecture for the Heberden Society today. I've worked as an HIV specialist since 1992. I feel like I've been incredibly fortunate to have been a part of the team at the Center for Special Studies. When I started at CSS, AIDS was nearly always fatal. Our patients died every week. Hospitals across the country and around the world were filled with patients dying of AIDS or AIDS-related conditions. We were front and center in the 1990s to the transformation of this terrible illness into a chronic condition managed by effective medication, not cured, but no longer necessarily lethal. In the early 2000s, I began writing a book about my experiences and those of my patients and colleagues. I wanted to document those incredible years between 1992 and 2000, so much awfulness mixed, mixed with so much grace. My book, Voices in the Band, was published in 2015. It wasn't exactly a bestseller, but Nicole Milano, the director of the Heberden Society, she read my book last year and she invited me to come and speak to you today. So today I'll give a brief history of the HIV epidemic in its first 20 years in order to give you some background and context for the book that I wrote. <clears throat> I'll read a couple or a few expert excerpts from the book, from Voices in the Band, to bring you a sense of what our work and our patients were like in that time. And then I'd like to reflect on aspects of the current epidemic and touch on some of the similarities and differences. My comparison of COVID and HIV was partially informed by a conversation I had last month by phone with Dr. Anthony Fauci, who was kind enough to call me to help me with this talk and to whom I'm extremely grateful. As a bit of an aside, I'd like to suggest for anyone interested that this article by Kent Sepkowitz from 2001 is a great review. Kent was a colleague at CSS early on and has been at Memorial for over 20 years. This article is very thorough. It also touches on some of the wackier aspects of the history of AIDS, including the highly visible cat fight over who really discovered HIV, the long list of exotic and ineffective treatments that were tried by patients and doctors desperate for a remedy, and the conflict around AZT, the first drug approved for the treatment of HIV, a drug that was both welcomed and reviled. I'd first like to situate us in the history of epidemics to put into context the HIV epidemic. Epidemic is defined as a widespread occurrence of an infectious disease in a community at a particular time. And pandemic refers to the spread over an entire country or the world. Here's a list from the WHO of notable pandemics in history. And we can see that two of the three worst pandemics in history have occurred in really the last 100 years with the Spanish flu being responsible for over 50 million deaths worldwide after the First World War, and the current HIV infection being responsible for more than 40 million deaths since 1981. Only the bubonic plague nearly 600 years ago killed as many people. A little later in the talk, I'll show another timeline that reveals the impact of these numbers. And as you can see here, since the Middle Ages, all the listed epidemics are caused by viral illnesses. I'll point out that smallpox, tuberculosis, and malaria are diseases which have killed many millions of people over many centuries, but they're not on this list because of their ubiquity in history. And of course, our lives in the last two years have been hugely impacted by the current epidemic with SARS-CoV-2, which has significantly overshadowed HIV and siphoned both attention and resources. So HIV has faded from the front pages of the newspapers but this pandemic is far from over. Most talks on the history of HIV will mention this article on the left from the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report that represents the first description of what we know now were cases of AIDS. The report described five previously healthy homosexual men in three different hospitals in California. They had biopsy-proven pneumocystis pneumonia. This pneumonia was rare and was known to occur exclusively in people with compromised immune function. The men also had infections with candida, 
and cytomegalovirus. What's notable is that the, by the time this little cohort of patients was described, HIV was already well embedded in several demographic groups around the country. Cases of what we'd later come to know as AIDS were presenting sporadically as an isolated case of cerebral toxoplasmosis here or an unexplained case of CMV retinitis there. It really wasn't until several cases at once appeared that the medical community began to really take notice. You can see the New York Times picked up on it within a month with this article that discussed Kaposi sarcoma and severe immune deficiency in 41 homosexual men. The early name for this condition was gay-related immune deficiency or GRID. By the end of 1981, there were 270 documented cases of severe immune deficiency and 121 of those individuals affected had died. Just as a timeline, in 1982, the first clinic for treatment of the infection opened in San Francisco. Here in New York, the gay men's health crisis opened, um, was founded. Uh, con Congress designated some funds to go to the CDC and the NIH, and the first infants with this condition were diagnosed. And in September, the CDC used the term acquired immune deficiency syndrome for the first time. 771 cases and 618 deaths in, in 1982. And in 1983 and 84, we saw further discoveries and increased knowledge of what we were dealing with. I particularly like to point out that by 1983, we knew that this illness was carried in blood and body fluids. It wasn't transmitted in a hug or on a toilet seat. It wasn't something in the air or lurking on a doorknob. Luc Montagnier, then Robert Gallo and Jay Levy all had samples from the same patients and they eventually realized the retrovirus they'd each separately identified was in fact the same virus and they named it human immunodeficiency virus as the cause of acquired immune deficiency syndrome. So I'd like to read a short passage from my book about those first years as I experienced them. In the summer of 1982, after my first year of medical school, I met some friends for lunch at my roommate's house in Philadelphia. One of the people there was a fourth year medical student at a big hospital in New York. He told us of an illness occurring in gay men that made them very sick and sometimes killed them. No one knew what it was or what caused it. He mentioned that people use the term GRID, which stood for gay related immune deficiency. The, stu the student said that more and more cases of this strange but terrible illness were showing up in other hospitals in New York. And the cases were now being reported in other cities around the country. We talked that day of how or why gay men would be victims of a disease like this. From the student's description, it sounded scary and ominous. Within the next two years, I'd seen several cases of this illness on my ward rotations. The patients were all young, young people in their 20s and 30s, and they were desperately sick. Some had terrible pneumonia caused by pneumocystis, an organism that only had rarely been seen before. Some patients were covered with purple spots and carried the diagnosis of a sarcoma that was supposed to affect only old men in Greece. Others were just skin and bones, unable to eat or feverish for reasons that we could not figure out. Gay men made up the majority of our patients with others being intravenous drug users, both male and female, and the sexual partners of those drug users. In recognition of this broader patient population, the name for the illness became Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, or AIDS. At about this time in 1984, I heard a lecture by an infectious diseases specialist at the University of Vermont. <clears throat> he spoke of an illness affecting large portions of communities in Central Africa, in Uganda and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, known then as Zaire. It was recognized in Africa as slim disease because patients had severe unremitting diarrhea and could not eat. They became profoundly wasted and after months of sickness, they died. A high prevalence of tuberculosis in these regions complicated and generally worsened the course of this illness, which predominantly affected young adults and working age people. Because the ill could not work and, requ and required someone to care for them, economic downturns were becoming apparent in these already impoverished regions. The infectious diseases specialist giving the talk noted the link between slim disease and the acquired immune deficiency syndrome, formerly GRID, now being seen in the United States. 
research indicated that AIDS and slim disease were manifestations of the same condition. Increasing numbers of cases were being diagnosed in the, in the US such that by the end of 1984, over 7,000 Americans had died or were suffering from AIDS. By 1985, there were over 16,000 cases and the number of deaths just kept rising. Part of the reason I named my book Voices in the Band was in tribute to this book. Randy Schiltz was a journalist in San Francisco whose only beat was covering the HIV epidemic. As a gay man, he wrote about the epidemic that surrounded him and killed many friends, and eventually it killed him. He wrote about the patients and their families and friends, the doctors and the scientists and the politicians as HIV steamrolled across the country. The book is full of heroes and villains, and it's really a giant of a book, and I highly recommend it to anybody who's, who, who's looking for a thorough understanding of those earliest years. Within, within, within 10 years, there were over 150,000 cases and, and 120,000 deaths from this illness. When I look at this graph and these numbers now, I, I realize that COVID has kind of inured me to their impact. The COVID numbers are in order of magnitude higher, as we all know. But in the US in 1990, these numbers were staggering. As the solid line on this graph indicates, the rise in number of deaths was climbing steadily every single year. And by 1992, HIV was the leading cause of death from any cause among men aged um, 25 to 44. I'm gonna put a plug in for another book that inspired me to write Voices in the Band. This is Dr. Vergesi's book, My Own Country. And in this book, he wrote about being a newly minted ID specialist in a rural part of Tennessee. The scary disease of gay men was something far, far away, except that it wasn't. Vergesi documented that the young gay men who'd fled their conservative corner of Tennessee to go live their lives in New York or San Francisco or Atlanta, they were now coming home with AIDS to be cared for or rejected by their families. His work was all consuming and often lonely, but he writes beautifully of his experience and his patients and their families. Two thirds of the cases of AIDS around the world are in Sub-Saharan Africa, where the vast majority of cases are spread heterosexually. Initially known as slim disease, AIDS cut an awful path through some countries. I always think it's important to share this graph, which illustrates the changes in life expectancy in the countries in Africa where HIV infections were rampant. As you can see, in the 1950s, overall life expectancy was quite low as there was little healthcare infrastructure in many places and few, if any, vaccines. Through the second half of the 20th century, you can see the life expectancy in all these places improved. It improved dramatically until HIV came along. The solid lines here represent countries where there was a high prevalence of HIV. In some areas, HIV prevalence was near 30% of the adult population. These areas suffered dramatically in far-reaching ways. Life expectancy declined, but so did economic well-being as the grocer or the teacher or the postman became ill. And the stigma around HIV was very severe in many of these places. The early 1990s were really hard years in the HIV epidemic. The numbers just kept rising. There were cases all over the world. By 1996, there were an estimated 23 million people with HIV. And here in the US, AIDS cases were filling the hospitals and clinics and emergency rooms. The general public's awareness of and response to the AIDS epidemic varied. Here are two different projects that helped bring understanding and compassion to the many lives impacted by the epidemic. On the left, you see the NAMES project, AIDS Memorial Quilt, which was conceived by Cleve Jones in San Francisco in 1985. Each panel of a quilt held a name or a memento of a person who had died from AIDS. The last display of the entire AIDS memorial quilt was in October of 1996, when the quilt covered the entire National Mall in Washington, DC, as showed on the slide, as an estimated 1.2 million people came to view it. The quilt is currently housed at the American Folklife Center in the Library of Congress, and it weighs over 54 tons. The movie Philadelphia was based on a true story of a young lawyer who was fired from his prestigious law firm because he had AIDS. 
Directed by Jonathan Demme, it was one of the first mainstream Hollywood films to address HIV AIDS and homophobia. AZT had been approved in 1987 as the first drug to treat HIV, but it was quickly apparent that it was not effective. AZT inhibits reverse transcriptase, and the next several drugs for HIV targeted the same enzyme. There was hope that two drugs might work better than one, but we were not seeing much of an improvement, and people kept dying. I'd like to read from my book another section that gives an idea of what our patients dealt with. This is from a chapter entitled Weekend on Call. Timothy lay on a stretcher by the wall near the nurse's station. The busy emergency room bustled back and forth past him. As I approached, I took in his profound emaciation, the yellow and gray skin, the sweaty hair matted to his head. His mother stood by the stretcher and held his hand. As he noticed me, I saw that his eyes looked very tired behind his round steel rim glasses. His mother turned following Timothy's gaze. Oh, what a relief to see a friendly face, she said, smiling. Her face too looked strained and exhausted. I held out my hand and she reached out with her free hand to shake mine. I put my other hand on Timothy's shoulder. I'd met Timothy, a patient of Dr. Jacobs on a previous weekend on call. Once when Dr. Jacobs had been unavailable, I'd seen Timothy and his mother in my office. Now she said, he had been doing so well on Friday night. We thought the change would do him good, you know, to get out to the country. We have a house in Western Pennsylvania near the Ohio border. Timothy was happy to go. He used to spend all his summers there. He seemed so glad and he slept well when we arrived. But Saturday morning, he started shivering. And I knew, I just knew we should come back. She spoke in a rushed way, her voice a mixture of anxiety and fatigue. Oh, mom. Timothy's voice was weak and soft. I turned toward him and saw much more than those two words. The look in his eye said she shouldn't blame herself, said he was very nearly done. It said he loved her. His brothers were there too. They'll be coming later. He didn't want to leave. He was having fevers and the boys were playing catch in the yard. I call them boys. They're all grown men. We bundled him up so he could sit outside and watch. She started to cry. He was sweating and he seemed so happy to watch them playing catch. They tossed him the ball a few times. They wanted him there with him, with them. Mom. She checked herself and took a breath. She looked back down at him and put her hand on his chest. The tenderness in her eyes as she gazed at him made my throat ache. I was worried that I might sob. But she controlled her tears and he reached up and held her hand. He had closed his eyes. It was clear that we had to get back. Dr. Jacobs has always re re recommended that we try to get here if we can. We went to the local emergency room. The hospital there is very small. They heard that he had, has AIDS and they got us an ambulance immediately. I think they couldn't get us out of there fast enough. And it was a long, long night, but I'm glad we're here. I'm glad you're here. What a time you've had, I said. 34 years old, the youngest of three sons, Timothy had a boyish smile and his damp, sandy hair usually curled off his face. I had a crush on him from the moment I met him. He had a scruffy student look that totally charmed me. I always felt that I was meeting him at the wrong time. I wished we had not been patient and doctor. In another time, we would have been friends. In another time, he was my classmate in medical school. He lived in my building. He shopped for smelly cheese at the store where I shopped and we laughed about it in the checkout line. He was a friend I hadn't met, but now I knew if we wouldn't, we would never get the chance to meet as friends. Timothy's boyfriend, Andrew, had died three years ago. They'd been together for more than 12 years. In the last year or so, Timothy's condition had deteriorated. His mother had moved back up from Florida to help and he was happy to have her near. Despite the anguish of the circumstances, she did not want to be anywhere else. Timothy's father had died when Timothy was still in college. Well, I said, I talked to the attending and he said your ambulance drivers were not helpful. Did they really just bring you in and leave you without speaking to anyone? They barely said a word to us for 300 miles. It was good that you called me last night and let me know you were coming. I wish you didn't have to wait down here, but I'm hoping a bed will open up soon. It's all right, Dr. Ball. Everyone here has been very kind. Timothy opened his eyes again and I looked at him and said, Timothy, I know that you and Dr. Jacobs have discussed this before, 
and with your mother too. But each time you're admitted, we're supposed to ask you how you feel about certain treatments that are offered in the hospital if you need them. Timothy's mother was shaking her head and looking at the floor. I'm talking about whether or not you'd want to be placed on a breathing machine if you needed one. If you stopped breathing in the night, would you want to be resuscitated? No, he said very quietly. No, we have talked about this with Dr. Jacobs, said his mother. After the long stay in the ICU last year, Timothy said he didn't want to go through that again. Timothy met my eyes and shook his head. I don't want that stuff, he said. I nodded. I know things have been tough these last few weeks. You've been through a lot. We're gonna keep you as comfortable as we can. Your fever worries me a bit and your blood pressure's a little low. Likely there's an infection somewhere. We'll get you some fluids and antibiotics, then see what your blood tests show. I'm sure that you'll feel a bit better with some hydration, but for now, no, no ICU, right? Thank you. The boys are coming later. Timothy's mother smiled. Yes, they're going to close up the house. Henry, the oldest, lives in Pittsburgh, so they'll stop there on the way to New York. That'll be good. I'm sure you'll be happy to see them. Part of the wait down here is because I want you to have your own room. It should be on our floor upstairs, so you'll be able to spend the night in the room if you'd like to. The nurses are good about that. I'm on call, so if there are any problems, please just have me paged. I took out my stethoscope and examined Timothy as well as I could, given the lack of privacy and the noise of the busy ER. Timothy's was not the only stretcher in the hall, and everywhere there were bodies and voices. It was a typical emergency room zoo with nurses, doctors, patients, students, visitors, security guards, orderlies, and transport staff all milling about. I wished I could offer Timothy and his mother a quieter place. I looked around and found a chair for her. The thought of their long ride last night in the ambulance with an unfriendly crew bothered me. It reflected on all of us when health professionals behaved poorly, but I knew that AIDS stirred up a lot of fear and discomfort in people. I wondered if the ambulance drivers felt changed by their experience of bringing Timothy to, to New York. The line, after that, they were never the same, went through my mind. Death changes us, every moment changes us. I held Timothy's hand briefly, then shook his mother's hand again as I turned to leave. She reached out and gave me a hug. I struggled not to cry. We all knew it was coming. It was likely that Timothy wouldn't survive another month, perhaps not another week. As a doctor, I knew that my patient, this patient was dying. Timothy knew as well. He didn't talk about it, didn't have much energy to spend thinking about it, but he knew. And his mother knew too. I could only imagine the nights and days she'd spent in the last few years thinking about it, worrying and waiting, and now knowing that it soon would be true, that her son, her golden boyish boy, her youngest would soon be gone. I hugged her back. And then things changed. The new class of drugs, protease inhibitors, had started being used in 1995. And at the International Conference on AIDS in Vancouver in 1996, we heard the dramatic and welcome news that these drugs, when used in combination, with previously approved medications resulted in reducing the amount of virus in the blood to undetectable levels and kept it there. With no virus around, a patient's immune system soon recovered. After years of negative news at this conference, the good news heralded the beginning of a dramatic change in our ability to treat HIV. And what you see here is a graph of that success. The blue line with the triangles represents cases fitting an AIDS diagnosis. I'll point out that the decrease that you can see starting in 1993 was not because of treatment, but because of a reformulation of the definition of AIDS. But clearly there's a prolonged decrease in numbers of new cases extending out to 1998. As patients got on medications, less infections were transmitted. The red line with the diamonds represents AIDS deaths. And as you can see, this line plummeted between 1995 and 98 dramatically illustrating the effectiveness of the highly active antiretroviral, antiretroviral therapy, what we used to call HEART. As, and as a result, we see the yellow line with the circles climbing up off the graph. This is people living with AIDS, not dying, living. And here's another version of that graph from the CDC showing the leading cause of death among persons 25 to 44 years old. For a few terrible years, HIV led them all, but the red line here shows in 1995 the death rate falling. The de declining death rate 
has continued as this slide demonstrates. HIV disease fell to fifth place from all these causes from 97 through 2000 to sixth place from 2001 to 2009 and then fell to ninth place in 2019, causing about 800 deaths or 1% of all deaths in this age group. I'm gonna read another short section from my book is this success in treatment manifested in our patients. Roman's face told an abridged version of the story. He smiled at my disbelieving look when he finally made it back from the Hamptons in October. For the first time, I could see that his eyes were light brown. In the four months since he started taking his cocktail of new medications, the disfiguring purple swellings over his eyelids had faded. His eyelids remained slightly puffy and pink, but it was as if the lesions had reversed course like a flower blooming backwards. Roman had put on some weight, which lent an increased look of health to his handsome face. He brushed his fair hair back from his forehead. And as he talked, his breathing came easily. He never coughed. The pulmonary lesions on his chest X-ray had nearly disappeared as well. Roman told me that at first he'd found it very difficult to take the medication. He'd felt sick and the requirement to take pills every eight hours on an empty stomach thoroughly disrupted his eating schedule. Gradually, he said, he, adju he adjusted. I knew I didn't have a choice. I asked him if he'd missed any dose doses. Not once, he said, never once. Though remarkable, Roman's case was not unique. In these last months, we'd seen several patients whose KS lesions had markedly faded since they started taking combination therapy that included protease inhibitors. Other patients with symptoms or conditions of advanced HIV improved on the medication as well. Those with profound wasting began to gain weight. Those with unexplained rashes saw their skin clear up, and several patients reported their unremitting diarrhea had stopped within weeks of starting on a regimen with protease inhibitors. As I looked back at 15 years of death and no effective treatments to offer, the changes at first seemed like illusions as if conjured by magic. I almost felt that at any moment, the real disease would rear up and devour my patients. But slowly I began to believe. The blood test supported this symptomatic improvement, revealing significant increases in T cell counts. Patients taking the cocktail, as we began calling the combination of medications, they took a lot of pills with lots of side effects, but showed slow, steady improvement in their immune systems. Most patients with low T cells also had hundreds of thousands of copies of virus per milliliter of blood. Some viral loads were in the millions. With the new technology, we began to routinely measure viral load levels. We used the viral load assay to measure the amount of virus at the initiation of therapy. Once patients were on the medication for a few weeks, these levels dropped so low, the assay couldn't find any virus at all. Patients achieved undetectable viral loads. It was stunning. In December, at clinic rounds one afternoon, Zoe Prin, one of our psychiatrists, told us that one of her patients, a large woman, had stood up in the middle of their session and with grand gestures sung a loud a cappella version of O Come All Ye Faithful. The exuberance and hopefulness of joyful and triumphant resonated throughout the days at CSS. We had clearly turned a corner in our ability to treat HIV. Success and recovery became very real possibilities and the deep gloom of AIDS lifted with the stories of increasing T cells, returning appetites and fewer cases of PCP. These days, we have a lot of effective combination therapies to choose from, with novel, novel therapies being approved and in the pipeline. Our patients used to take many pills multiple times a day, some with food, some without. Side effects were rampant and long-term toxic, toxic effects were not uncommon. Gradually, the drugs became simpler to take, combination pills were developed, pills were smaller, better tolerated and safer and effective against the virus if taken as prescribed. We use the word adherence. Patients who are adherent to their regimens do well. We no longer say compliance when talking about patients taking their medication. Adherence is key for antiretroviral efficacy. I wanna read one more little section about Roman. Um, I went out to the waiting room to call in my next patient. It struck, it struck me with a pang how normal Roman looked as he got up and walked toward me. He wore a stylish tan overcoat and dark green corduroy slacks. 
His tortoiseshell glasses made him look like an English professor, an appearance accentuated by the long hair brushed back from his face. You would never guess those light brown eyes crinkling in a smile had once been nearly covered with the purple lesions of Capaces. Roman's health had never taken a downward turn once since he got on his HIV medication. In four years, he could count on one hand the number of doses of medication he'd missed, three times a day, every day. His viral load remained undetectable and his T cells had risen slowly and steadily from the single digits to the hundreds, 200s, 300s. His, thankfully, was not the only success story in my practice, but it always made me happy to see him. I found it almost hard to imagine now that he'd been covered with chaos, with a chest X-ray that revealed lungs full of lesions. Had he not started taking an effective regimen when he did, I had no doubt that he'd been in it, he would have been dead within months, maybe weeks. And instead, here, here he was looking fit and relaxed in a chair in my office. Roman, you look great. I'm feeling fine. Will you be checking my blood today? Your last labs were done in July when you were here. The time passes quickly. It looks like you missed an appointment in October. So yes, we'll do your labs today. Do you have enough medication? He nodded, yes. I called for refills last month. And you're still just as steady with taking your pills. He nodded again. I never miss them. Why would I miss them? They're no trouble. His accent created an almost musical quality to his voice. I'm so glad. You do a great job. What are your plans for the holidays? He took a deep breath, held it for a moment, and said, I'm going home. Home to Brazil? He smiled, adjusting his glasses. Yes, Brazil. I haven't seen my mother in 12 years. But if you go back, if you go there, you can't come back, can you? No, I have no visa. Roman's vacation visa had expired a few months after he first got to the United States over 12 years ago. He managed to stay with the help of a woman he worked for. If he left and went back to Brazil, he could not return to the United States. Once in a while, he'd mentioned his wish to go home to see his mother and his friends, but he worried about having HIV there, getting care. He worried about being able to find work. Brazil, however, unlike many other countries, had made a commitment to caring for patients with HIV in the early 1990s. All patients had access to medications. Brazil's forward thinking and aggressive treatment programs kept its infection rates very low and made it a leader among countries having large indigent populations. In contrast, the president of South Africa in the early 1990s had declared that the AIDS epidemic simply did not exist. His government did not support HIV education or prevention and treatment programs, with the result that in many poor communities in South Africa, the HIV infection rates approached 30% by the end of the decade. I didn't worry that Roman was returning to Brazil. I felt confident that he'd get excellent care and be able to continue all his medications. If anything, he might find less stigma there as well, given Brazil's open acknowledgement of the epidemic. Roman, I'm really glad for you, and I'm glad for your mother. She'll be happy to see you, I'd imagine. Roman laughed and the brown of his eyes was not obscured by any purple spot or scar, a far different image from what had been the case three years before. Before he left, he gave me a hug. I wished him luck and told him that we missed it. we'd miss him. Roman had done all the hard work just by taking his medicine. I couldn't hope to fix what was broken for so many of my patients. I cheered when the virus became undetectable, but prescriptions couldn't heal a broken home or an abusive childhood or 10 years in jail for drug possession. Roman had a healthy life and I didn't have many patients like him. You may also have heard about an injectable form of treatment for HIV that requires administration only once every two months. That's the most re recent innovation in the treatment of HIV. We've really come so far. And treatment has slowly but surely been being made available to people all over the world, specifically in the underserved areas of Sub-Saharan Africa that I mentioned earlier. All countries have made effective antiretroviral therapy available. There are national treatment programs in many countries and PEPFAR, the Gates Foundation and the Clinton Foundation and others are helping to ensure that the people who need treatment have access to it. In 2015, for the first time, more than half of those infected with HIV worldwide were receiving treatment. The most recent numbers show that this has increased to over 70%. And as this slide shows, with very, fairly wide ranges, the WHO estimates that there have been roughly 
80 million people infected with HIV since 1981 and over 36 million deaths. Now that's in contrast to our current COVID epidemic. The previous slide is data for over a 40 year period. And here is data from Johns Hopkins Resource Center in two years, there have been over 470 million cases of COVID and to date over 6 million deaths. We are currently right now on the threshold of yet another surge of cases in this country. Vaccines have made a huge difference. And as you can see that nearly 11 billion doses have been administered, but what will we be saying in 40 years? Earlier, I showed a chart showing the placement of HIV in history and the numbers of deaths associated. The chart here is from a website named The Visual Capitalists, which looks at the history of pandemics. Note that they are not in chronological order. The first two are the Black Death and the Plague of Justinian. Both were bubonic plagues caused by Yersinia pestis spread from fleas on rodents and animals. Note that the Justinian plague, known to have occurred in Europe in the middle of the sixth century, occurred when the estimated population of the world was 210 million people and it killed over 19% of the world's population. 800 years later, from 1347 to 1351, the bubonic plague raged again. This was the Black Death. The world's population was estimated to be 390 million at this time. This website lists the death toll at 200 million. The range in other web at websites is between 75 and 200 million across Europe and the Middle East but it seems between a third and half of the entire world population died from this plague. And contrast this with our more recent epidemics. HIV AIDS has killed over 30 million people, but with an estimate of 4.46 billion people on earth, that 30 million is just 0.7%, less than 1%. And with COVID, though the numbers in just two years are staggering, the 6 million deaths thus far are far less than 0.1% of the 7.9 billion people in the world today. I'm not minimizing the devastation of either of these pandemics, but it is worth noting that we really cannot even conceive of an epidemic that wipes out half the people on earth as the Black Death did 700 years ago. I didn't think that I could speak today just about HIV. The shadow cast by COVID in our current day-to-day -day is just too great. So on a bit of a whim, I wrote to Dr. Fauci's office because if there's one similarity for these two epidemics, it's his presence. You're all probably aware that Dr. Fauci did his residency here at the New York Hospital, as it was then called. After residency, Dr. Fauci went to work at the NIH and became, after some persuading, a vital force in getting effective medications approved for treatment of HIV. His role in the COVID epidemic in this country cannot be overstated. I asked his assistant in an email if he might have time to speak with me about these two epidemics. And I'm still a bit starstruck to tell you that he called me the very next day. I asked him to speak to some of the similarities and differences between HIV and COVID. Dr. Fauci noted that there are more dissimilarities than similarities, but one important similarity he pointed out is that both HIV and SARS-CoV-2 were previously unknown zoonotic infections that out of nowhere made the leap into humans and caused what he referred to as globally impactful outbreaks. New infections pop up all the time, but they rarely survive to disseminate among humans. HIV's presence was insidious and took several years to be recognized, whereas the SARS-CoV-2 epidemic exploded in just a few months. Dr. Fauci told me that for him, the biggest difference in the two epidemics was what he referred to as the social atmosphere. The activism of the late 1980s and early 1990s, particularly with ACT UP, was directed at the government demanding that more be done, demanding that the FDA stop dragging its feet over getting drugs from the bench to the bedside. Dr. Fauci was a target of this activism early on. And as he said to me on the phone, the activists were correct, more needed to be done. The government should and could do more. Significant funding began and changes in drug approval pathways shortened the time tremendously. In contrast, as Dr. Fauci mentioned, the activism of the, current pro of the current protests against the government regarding COVID, they're based on misinformation, fantasies, and conspiracy theories. This graph shows the enormous difference in hospitalization rates between COVID cases in the vaccinated and unvaccinated. 
I showed this graph to a patient of mine just last week when she told me that she hadn't been vaccinated and didn't intend to because as she said, I haven't gotten it yet. Her refusal was based on a conspiracy therapy on a, on a conspiracy theory that was ludicrous, racist, and anti-Semitic. Dr. Fauci and I did not discuss politics or politicians. However, it's apparent that a similarity for both epidemics was the arrogance and ignorance that informed the decisions at the highest levels. Here on the left is a transcript from a press conference in 1982 at the White House, where a question about gay plague was greeted with laughter and smug homophobia. And on the right are some quotes from the president in early 2020, noting that COVID would just disappear. Ronald Reagan didn't mention the word AIDS for several years, and Donald Trump as the president took no responsibility. I hesitated to include this in my talk today, but one cannot help but wonder how much less suffering there would have been in this country had these men been more willing to work with public health experts and scientists. Of course, the latter made their own mistakes. These novel infections didn't come with instruction booklets, but I believe we could have done a lot better. I would like to note that these observations are my own and have not been reviewed by or approved by anyone at my institution. So here are some aspects to compare and contrast the two epidemics. Things that are similar include the things that I've mentioned, as well as the high death tolls, the trauma for patients, providers, and families, and the recognition of aspects of the world that are changed due to the pandemic. Differences range from one disease embedding itself before its actual recognition and COVID's explosive contagion, and the two infections are, are transmitted in quite different ways. Also the fact that COVID has these emerging variants. And unlike for HIV, we've been really fortunate to develop multiple effective vaccines against COVID. And a final similarity is the sadness of knowing that so many people have died alone. In COVID, the isolation restrictions were and are heartbreaking for many. In HIV, we saw people dying alone because of stigma and prejudice. Yet I can attest, and I'm sure many of you can remember, how so many times the care we provided helped our patients feel less lonely. And many of the terrible deaths from AIDS, AIDS were surrounded with love. And our PPE hasn't really changed all that much. I'd like to leave you with one more excerpt from the book I wrote about my experiences in the 1990s. It's from the epilogue at the very end of the book, 10 years after the body of the book takes place. I don't miss those bad old days of HIV care. Even just the few patients I've seen today remind me of the sad, hollow feeling of watching so many young people dying from an illness we could not treat. But in the 1980s and early 1990s, it had been like trekking on another planet exploring unknown territory where few wanted to go. Our precious camaraderie bonded us, bonded us together, bonded us too with our patients as we tried to help and protect them. Maybe it's a bit like the metaphor of the battlefield where we shared a sense of being alive, doing something brave and important. Today, our care for our patients can become routine. We spend a lot of time talking about taking pills and stopping smoking. The feeling of serving on a unique and noble battlefront has diminished. I recognize that we have good medications, effective treatment for HIV, but there is much in my patients' lives that goes untreated. For so many, AIDS is one symptom in a life of limited opportunities, unmet needs, and inequities. Still, it gets no less hard to see patients dying from this disease. I'd like to dedicate this talk to my sons, Jules and Paris, who have listened to endless harangues about safer sex and condoms and boyfriends and girlfriends, and who I hope will continue to be the generous and spontaneous and adorable kids that I love. And to my colleagues, John and Sam, and to Sherry, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ball. I'd like to open up the floor for the Q&A. There's a Q&A box where you can submit some questions. While I wait for uh, the first questions, I've written two down if I can start. So the first question that I have is, could you talk about the progression throughout your career of interdisciplinary care teams that care for patients with HIV and AIDS and how, from your perspective, that has changed from the beginning to now? 
I'm so glad you asked that question, Pauline. That's such a great question because really the I part of the reason I feel so fortunate to have had the career that I've had is because of working at CSS, with CSS, which is really founded on the idea of multidisciplinary care. We have people that help us um, in our clinic. Not it's not just the doctors by any stretch. The social workers, the nurses, um, do just phenomenal work, and our work we just really couldn't do it without them. Even our front desk staff, and we have nutritionists, we have psychiatry, we have an OBGYN. We just have a lot of people that are working to help our patients. And that model has continued even, even now uh, at CSS. And it, we continue, I think, to provide a level of care for our patients, which is um, somewhat unique um, in medicine, really, because um, it, it's hard to provide this kind of care and be so comprehensive. And I think our patients really, really benefit from it. So thank you for asking the question. Sure, of course. Um, I have a comment from Ruth Friley. Thank you so much for all that you've done for so many people with AIDS and their families, Dr. Paul. I just ordered your book and look forward to reading it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so while I wait for another question, um, I will ask my second question. Do you have any words of advice for young trainees as they are launched into the beginnings of their career throughout the COVID pandemic, um, since this sort of mirrors your own um, launching into your career at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic? Yes, that uh, it's, a, it's an interesting point. I will say that the vast majority of my colleagues are in, trained in infectious diseases <clears throat> because of my getting into it um, when I did uh, the initial, we were initially under the umbrella of general medicine because patients could present in such a variety of ways, you know, from psychiatric issues to GI issues to dermato dermatologic issues, but ultimately it's an infectious disease. But, you know, seeing um, COVID coming along um, and there's, there's no question that we're going to be seeing novel infections in, in the future. And so for people interested in being at the forefront of, of, of something like this, of a, of, a, of a pandemic or trying to care for people, being an infectious disease is a pretty interesting field. Um, and there's a lot, there's a lot to offer. I hope, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. So we have another question from Oliver Fine. Um, how important was your experience with narrative medicine, uh, the program at Columbia? Oh, that's a, that's a good question too. You know, I think for me, um, particularly in the 1990s, it just was such a um, intense time for the patients, for the providers, for our teams. And I would go home at the end of the day and, you know, talk to my family about it, or I would write about it. And when the narrative medicine program um, began, Rita Sharon's program in 2009 is when that the narrative medicine master's degree program started at Columbia. Um, I thought that that would be a really great way to help me finish this book that I had been trying to 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 write, um, and which I had actually put aside for a while because it was it really needed a lot of help. Um, and so getting into that program helped, and I had a a great teacher, Lynn Sharon Schwartz, who really helped me and and helped me get the writing much better so that I could get the book publisher. So from, from an HIV and my work standpoint and getting the book done, narrative medicine was really very important. But then since then, I've done a lot of teaching, as many of you know, um, a lot of teaching of narrative medicine in the medical school. And that's been really important to me. And I think it's a very, very important tool in helping uh, students and doctors connect with patients and connect with the work that they're doing. So it's, it's been very important for me. Our next question, um, do you have thoughts or insights about if or how doctors' attitudes towards gay men changed as a result of treating them during the AIDS pandemic? That's from Douglas Smith. Thank you for your question. Thank you for your question. You know, as I indicated, there, the early 80s and the 80s, there was a lot of homophobia in the United States. And I, I think, um, and I, I didn't go into that, but, you know, every hospital dealt with the, the some aspect of not wanting to take care of these patients, not just because they were gay, but because they had a really a bad illness that people didn't want to catch. And um, 
so the population was really hugely stigmatized. And our hospital, you know, wasn't a stellar example for a long time, but I, I feel we've come huge, huge distant, distance now. I think it's really a, a non-issue in our hospital anyway. I think there are parts of the country where uh, homophobia is still alive and well, but I think we've come a, a huge long way. I mean, you know, politically we've seen a great, a great, um, enormous changes. Um, so it was a, it was a tough time there um, in the early 80s when AIDS first came out, but um, we've made enormous progress. And, you know, these days in the hospital and HIV patient, people don't bat an eye. I mean, there are a lot of other issues that patients are coming in with. Um, and so, so that HIV is something that the, the, the house staff and the doctors and, and the nurses, everyone deals with, you know, right in, right in step. Thank you. Our next question, have you any idea of what your response might be verbally to the next group of people who will negate the implications of the next unexplained cause of illness. I'm sorry, could you just say that one more time, please? So in, um, I guess what your response would be verbally to the next group of people who will um, try to negate the implications of the next unexplained cause of illness that comes along. So I think you're respond? trying to say in light of the conspiracy theories and right. misinformation stuff, how are we gonna address the next time it happens? Exactly, I think. Um, you know, I think it's unfortunate that we have, uh, there's been a, a, um, a sense a slipping in the trust placed in science and public health. Uh, and I think it's important that politicians and public health experts work together. I think um, that is a, a, key, a key matter that, you know, people are specialized in, in their fields because they know a lot and they've studied it a lot. And so um, I'm giving you kind of a roundabout answer, but I think we have to believe in, in the public health experts and the scientists. You know, it's always very frustrating when there are deniers within those fields, which we've seen in HIV as well as, as in with COVID, as we all know. But um, I think we have to try and communicate well and and um, and link with with the politicians and politics so that the, the message gets across to the general public and that the general public has faith and trust in that the government's making decisions that are in their in their best benefit. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Are the traumas um, healthcare providers experienced during the early years of the AIDS epidemic distinct from or similar to the pro, uh, to those that the providers who have been on the front lines of the COVID pandemic? Um, and how has your work on AIDS affected your experience during the COVID pandemic? Yeah, that's, you know, Dr. Fauci actually mentioned one aspect of that in that as, as much as AIDS and H the HIV pandemic was, the numbers were enormous and it was very intense and, and tra traumatizing in some ways. It, the hospitals were not overwhelmed the way they have been with COVID. So that's been a really, a really challenging thing. And with so many health professionals themselves, nurses, doctors, orderlies, every, you know, people getting infected and not being able to work and putting other, so then other people have to work extra shifts and work more and more. I think it's been, I think it's been harder in some ways um, and the day-to-day -day work with COVID. But I will say that, you know, it, Dr. Fauci said he still has PTSD from his, his days in the NIH watching first, you know, 98% of his patients who came to him died. Um, Cause our patients, they, they, the, the mortality rates for our patients were really high and that was, um, that was hard to deal with. All right, thank you so much. So uh, that ends our Howard and Society lecture for tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul, for talking with us and answering our questions. Thank you to our audience uh, for joining and we will uh, send out the recording of this lecture in the following days. And as Nicole Milano mentioned earlier, our next uh, lecture will be at the end of April 
uh, good subject, pushing cool, big tobacco, racial marketing, and the untold story of the menthol cigarette. We look forward to seeing you then. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.